Good morning, Revolution, and welcome everybody to our show this morning, all of our Facebook friends and comrades and YouTube friends and comrades and Scott and Anita and Michael. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Revolution. morning, Revolution. There you go. Scott is out there in the woods, you know, looking all rustic and, you know, you, you uh, on a deck uh, in the fall weather. This is my natural ready? habitat, Joe. Mm -hmm. That's your uh, your your uh, Facebook. No, I mean your Halloween outfit. You're gonna come as Paul Bunyan or something. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna start. I got a I got a you know bag of bloody knives and chainsaws and stuff. I'm just gonna terrorize the neighborhood for a while. Colonist <laughs> Daniel Boone. You'll be a settler colonial. You come to the oh that that's great. A, Thanks for that. <laughs> as a settler colonialist, no oh boy. Uh, you know, we got to discuss that issue at one of our upcoming sessions. Uh, well, um, let's see. We're in the middle of a big, we talked about it a little bit last week, strike waves. Uh, and the workers are on the picket lines uh, all over the country, tens of thousands of them. A uh, hundred thousand voted to walk out, you know, um, 4.3 million people quit their jobs, uh, Anita, in uh, August. That's uh, right. They're calling it, uh, some are calling it the uh, great the resignation. Great, the great resignation. Uh, all the others are calling it a silent, I think Robert Reich, your favorite Berkeley professor, former <laughs> Secretary of Labor, said it was a silent general strike. I don't think I'm misquoting him on, mm -hmm. on that. Are we in a new class struggle moment, in your opinion? I, I think we definitely are. I think people's um, expectations were raised um, with the 2020 election, and then we want results. And when those results weren't forthcoming, I think striketober is, is what we're in right now. And I think um, that great resignation People are people are done with with jobs that you know require 16 hour days and seven days a week work. Um, people are just not going to stand for it anymore. Um, and I think they're really ready to stand up uh, to employers, to big corporations, and say enough already. Um, and we we've got strikes going on here in Ohio and and um, among teachers and uh, well t strike actions. Uh, and others, industrial uh, plant workers. Um, so I think we're really we're really seeing it here on the ground. Um, people are fed up and really are, you know, sharpening their demands and realizing that um, the current situation is is not delivering on the promises that we um, came to expect from the 2020 election. Fed up, fired up, and we're not going to take it anymore. I think I think that's right. kind of the, but. Uh, I'm a little confused now, Michael, because uh, we said it in the, a year ago in the Communist Party National Committee and National Board that we were in the middle of a socialist moment. Uh, so what is it? Is it a socialist moment or a class struggle moment or an anti-ultra-right moment? What, are we just mixing all everything up? Well, I don't think that one is in contradiction to another. I think it's always a class struggle moment, but I think that it gets stronger and more apparent uh, based on how the material conditions are. And so as Anita was saying, um, you know, there were expectations from the 2020 elections and the results um, aren't happening fast enough, you know, with the progressive agenda getting kind of uh, ripped apart in Congress, uh, watered down, um, and then the pandemic raging on. And so I don't think it's in contradiction to the socialist moment. I say that because uh, last Monday, when we were um, standing in solidarity with the Amazon workers or uh, trying to organize a union on Staten Island uh, here in New York City, there were a bunch of new uh, young YCLers who had never been part of like a, you know, a union organizing effort. And they were asking some of the veteran comrades, it was really cool. Uh, you know, is this what the class struggle is like? Is it always this exciting? Is it always this, um, involving and you know i think that's what it's all about so i don't think it's in, in contradiction to each other i think people are on uh guard because of what happened on january 6th so i do think it's an anti-extreme right moment i think it is a class struggle moment i think that's very apparent with striketober 
and we're still growing. The Communist Party's still growing. The YCL's still growing. At that, that Staten Island um, organizing effort, I think I met, you know, five or six new young YCLers who I hadn't met before. So I think it's all of it at once. But Scott, there is ebb and flow in any movement. I mean, you just can't, you know, maintain a high level of activity, you know, all the time. You know, uh, Trotsky talked about permanent revolution. Mm. And, well, you know, I mean, it, that's kind of unrealistic, isn't it? So, so what, I, I mean, I think, in your opinion, is the main uh, thing that defines the political moment at this particular moment in time? Uh, I, th I think it's less a question of ebb and flow here than of, of, of a certain kind of um, uneven advance on different fronts. So when we talked about the socialist moment, it was a class struggle moment, but it was a moment um, uh, where, where the ideological struggle took a huge step forward, where people were um, taking up new slogans, coming to new ideas, new possibilities, um, but where the the organized class struggle in terms of, of, of strikes, of labor struggles. Um, it, was, it was powerful, but it wasn't, um, you know, it, that wasn't what was at the foreground. And now um, that is, you know, that, that boots on the ground, labor actions, organizing um, is in the front. But the, again, like Michael said, they're not in contradiction with each other at all. They, they nourish each other. Um, and as for the, I mean, it has to be an anti-ultra right moment. And that has to be, you know, we've been saying for a long time, the, the working class has to lead the fight for democracy. You know, the, the no section of the ruling class, not the, you know, Gates or Bezos's or Biden's or um, not Warren, but whoever, none of them are going to lead the fight for democracy, are gonna, are gonna lead the fight to smash the fascist threat. That has to be the working class. But, but, you know, Anita, I mean, I was at the uh, demonstration on August the 28th for voting rights. Mm. It was militant, it was great, it was, but it was also small, you know, maybe five, 10,000 people. And uh, a year before that, there were, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people marching in the streets against racist police violence. <laughs> it kind of culminated uh, in the march to the ballot box on uh, November the 4th. Was it the 4th or the 3rd? I forget. So, um, and then there was a kind of, I mean, people stopped protesting, uh, unless you count January 6th as a protest. <laughs> I, I guess it was no. in a matter, but it was a counter-revolutionary <laughs> kind of uh, activity. So uh, I'm just wondering um, how we, uh, there has been a certain drop off in public attention to the, for example, what's happening in Congress and the uh, mm -hmm. debate on those bills. And, and as, a result, re as a result, they took out paid family leave, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Are you supporting that legislation now that paid family leave is out? Uh, me? I, I, uh, unfortunately, I don't get a vote in this, but I think um, <laughs> if they pass a $1.5 trillion uh, human infrastructure bill, it will be, it will be substantial and it will be, um, uh, it will really make uh, people's lives a little bit better. Not as, not, not to the degree that we had hoped. But I think uh, I heard Corey Bush talking about it this morning, and you know we just uh, we we've reached a, a compromise, and I think they have to have to take it and celebrate what we do have. Um, but it really is a, a disappointment, unfortunately. Um, and I think as far as protesting, I think it's just so it, it's so diffuse. Um, there's there are people who who would go out on the street for family and paid leave, pay, paid family leave. But, um, but that's mostly a problem that comes up to individuals when they're faced with a certain issue. Um, it's hard to, to mobilize large numbers of people about around that issue. And I think voting, the voting laws especially are, are also very nebulous. Um, we're not sure um, you know, whether Biden will really turn his attention to getting this, um, some voting rights uh, bill passed on the, on the national level after 
the uh, human infrastructure bills bill and the uh, infrastructure bill that's a bipartisan one passed. So we'll now, see. Michael Scott has given us something interesting to think about. He says that it's not so much ebb and flow, but it's uneven development. Uneven development, and which reminds me of the law that Lenin talked about of uneven development in capitalist but, uh, production internationally. Uh, and on the basis of that, he, he theorized the possibility of a weak link in the imperialist chain, and he applied that to Russia, and he said Russia was the, 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 the weak link, but maybe it can be applied domestically that because of different things that are happening in the economy and in the political structure, that, that things uh, take place unevenly. And, oh, and yeah. you can have several different things happen at the same time because, you know, while we're not strict economic determinists, uh, there is, you know, a multiplicity of things that are happening and, and therefore uh, political change takes place also unevenly depending on where you are and how you're affected by these changes. So has, yeah. has Scott made a theoretical breakthrough here? I, I kind of agree with that. Um, I was thinking about it the other morning um, and, and along those same lines. And I, I agree with Anita that, you know, the $1.5 uh, trillion, you know, it, it's not the, it's like getting a pair of socks on Christmas. You know, you need socks and it's better than getting nothing. But, you know, of course you want that computer or whatever as a Christmas gift. And so it, it is better than nothing, but it leaves something to fight for. And I think that is kind of where Striketober comes in because people feel kind of um, let down, uh, you know, they were, they were illusioned with, you know, getting a little bit more. And so I do think that it opens the door for uh, a wider arena of struggle. I think it opens the door for the people's movements and the student movements to uh, mobilize a little bit more, because as I understand that Manchin also had them cut down uh, some of the, the climate policy things out of the out of the uh, out of the build back better um, agenda and so there's lots of wiggle room i think for for protests to take place i agree with anita that i don't know if um paid family leave will be the big one but i think voting rights i think climate change i think all of that's gonna uh, it's gonna um be a reason to mobilize in the coming months yeah so scott did you make a theoretical breakthrough or is this just my mix and match marxism well, and, I, I, and I, I, i'm just kind of making shit up as i go along and, and I'm wondering uh, about it because I'm looking at it, you know, I, I was saying a couple of weeks ago that there was a crisis of inaction. But when I look at what happened on uh, August the 28th and then October the 3rd, the Women's March, which took place, I think, in what was it, 300 cities, Anita? And, 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 and then I look at the California recall vote where, you know, the, 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 the Republicans got their butt whooped. <laughs> wasn't even close. And then there was that election in Buffalo with India Walton. So maybe there's the, the, the working class and people's forces are kind of regathering their forces. And, and uh, you add the strike wave to that, and there's the beginning of a new upsurge given your thesis of uneven development. Yeah. Am I right or wrong? I, um, yeah, I think I agree. So the you know, we don't know where things are going to coalesce, you know, around what, what's going to become like the central node or whatever of, of a, um, a much broader, more organized militant um, uprising, but it's happening at different times in different ways in different, uh, around different issues in different sectors. Um, so I think, you know, we, we shouldn't, we definitely shouldn't lose hope um uh, it's we just have to as always i mean the party has always been working to bring together the different struggles weld them together into something that can um really challenge the power of the ruling class and politically in terms of the ultra right i think what we're seeing is a polarization you know there's uh less and less for me that this idea that you know some sort of centrist moderate neoliberal whatever consensus is the law of the day um, the 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 main forces are on the extreme right, uh, the the extreme right movement that you've talked about, and then um, 
you know, the, the people's movement, which is, I think, more and more now a working class movement. Um, uh, and and those, those are what's, the tension between those things are what's driving things forward. Well, neither the Republican right is organizing, you know, Trump 10,000 in Wellington, Ohio in June, and, and then another 15,000 in, in Georgia at the beginning of the month. And then just last weekend, uh, there were, you know, several thousand uh, at the fairgrounds in Des Moines, Iowa. I mean, the right wing is is organizing, uh, and and that's something to worry about, don't you think? Yes, I think it is definitely something to worry about. In fact, I I, I think the way on um, what we see, uh, at least I see locally, is how dark money from Republican sources is uh, feeding into um, school board campaigns in Ohio. School boards where you have um, your, your whole salary for the year is gonna be $2,000, but they're having, they're waging 60 and $70,000 campaigns to win those seats. And they mm. are, and they really misrepresent themselves. They, they just have the most anodyne, you know, um, uh, uh, literature that they're putting on people's, in people's mailboxes. Um, but really they have ulterior motives like uh, removing, rem I saw a letter uh, here in, in Columbus, rem uh, so, uh, school board candidates that wanna remove socialism from our schools um, and, and take away uh, critical race theory. Um, and uh, they're just, and, and they're, they're, they're moving to uh, ban books and, and you know, they, they wanna take away, uh, take uh, Toni Morrison's novel beloved off of the um, reading list for high school students. It's just like a dumbing down of, um, of the population that they want. I remember, I mean, I always have to look back to Donald Trump saying he loves the uneducated and, and it just seems like there's a big edge, uh, effort to um, increase their numbers uh, in the next, in the coming years. So I, I really see right. a problem at the local level too. I didn't know there was socialism in the schools. But speaking of socialism, uh, I read this, this morning uh, a news story uh, about a development in a socialist country that's got the uh, US military all worked up. They said that China has developed a new hypersonic weapon system and that it's a, uh, they, Michael, they said it's a Sputnik moment. And, um, and we, you know, Sputnik was the launch of the Soviet uh, spacecraft and, and uh, it, it had a race to the moon or something like that back in the day. And, uh, and they're talking about this Cold War kinds of, of terminology again and again and again. Uh, you know, I mean, What are we going to be able to do to prevent this kind of Cold War terminology? I think we have to call it out as we see it. You know, what is China? Seriously, what is China doing to fuel the flames of this Cold War? I don't see them doing anything. A lot of it's hearsay, you know, oh, they started the pandemic. They were, you know, they're developing this. But where's the evidence? What are they doing to disrupt world peace and everything? I know the Chinese government a few months ago, the Chinese Communist Party hosted something called the World um, Summit of Political Parties. And everyone was invited. I mean, the Social Democratic Party of Germany was there. The Pre Party from Mexico was there. And it, to me, was a very like pr progressive meeting for peace. It was very inclusive. It was very broad. And so, you know, that's that's what I see. You know, I see. But then I see the United States, the Trump uh, had uh, troops moved into uh, Taiwan um, around this time last year uh, when he was still in office and Biden hasn't taken them out of there. So that's that's where the Cold War is coming from. And so when we see this rhetoric coming out, I think we have to call it out and say that's not who the enemy is. The, ch the Chinese are not who the enemy is right now. Scott, we have a mailbag question which deals with the military. Let's say you know, the uh, party and a coalition comes to power in the United States uh, next year and, and we have state power. Um, what will we do with the military? Will we upgrade it or will we defund it? 
And and um, and if we do, what kind of uniforms are we going to have? Are we going to have some cool Soviet uniforms? Um, and how are we going to approach issues like freedom of religion? That's wow. a question we <laughs> a got lot of from questions. a reader. <laughs> Um, on the military, uh, on the military, you know, I think we have to look at what it is that I think working class people value now in the idea of military service, which is service to your country, which is comradeship, which is, you know, making a sacrifice to make the world better. And those are all things that, um, can be done without imperialism without invading other countries you know um the i think the military is going to have a different role it's we're going to develop something like a probably like a national service corps develop the national guard um i mean there will still i imagine there will still be uh, a military it will not be the object of half of our expenditures every year for sure um and it will be something you know designed to serve human need rather than generating profits for corporate arms dealers. Um, and the uniforms, uh, well, with a change in function, a change in uniform too, I imagine there'll be a lot more kind of uh, coveralls and a lot less body armor. Uh, but I don't know, that's, okay. that's just my vision. Anita, you going to defund the military or are you going to uh, upgrade it? No, I would I would transform it, uh, you know, to something completely different. Like like Scott says, turn turn it. Uh, you can take an organization like that, which is an awesomely put together, you know, machine, uh, administrative machine and and turn it to the working people's uh, purposes like, you know, I mean, like. They, I know the National Guard is called out when there's like disasters on the ground. I mean, I think there's a role for that kind of an organization in, in any culture, especially as we face climate change um, going forward. We need, we're going to have to grapple with disasters. Um, so I think, uh, I think there is a role, um, but to turn its purposes away from imperialism and towards human needs. And I'm, I'm sure we don't need the size of the military that we have. And we certainly don't need um, the weapon systems that we're um, that we're being we're, we're developing right now. I think we there's a lot of money to be saved. I don't think we need those things right now either. So um, you know, I think we could cut the military budget in half right now. Um, and we should even keep before it. socialism. And okay, Michael, defund or uh, upgrade the military. Well, I'm thinking uh, socialist of, I'm USA. Thinking I'm thinking of the party program and the history of the party. And as far back as I've read in party history, we've always been for demilitarization and defunding the military. And, and even at the height of the Cold War, I'm thinking of Gus Hall and Henry Winston, how they were always um, arguing for peace and, and you know, um, uh, peaceful coexistence. And so I don't know why that would change if we were to have um, state power. I still think we would be for defunding the military, ch obviously changing the, the role of the institution in itself and yeah so defunding and uh and and peaks yeah that would be the priority Scott, you were about to say something i was about to say that you know we should keep in mind that um the military is the thing we have in this country that most closely approximates what socialism could look like right this it's the biggest um publicly funded job training and job placement program. It provides housing and medical care to hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it's, you know, so it's, we have this kind of, in a certain sense, an infrastructure for socialism based on service, national service and whatever, but it's just something that's been, as I see it, taken over. Like to exist, it has to, you know, be pressed into the service of the ruling class and, and into violence and imperialism. But there's nothing inherently um, wrong, reactionary, uh, whatever about that kind of organization. Um, what about the uniform? <laughs> uh, Anita, you gonna get you a, you know, that question is so loaded. 
Why yes, have a it Soviet is. uniform? Socialism yeah, is not, it came into the world the first through in Paris, mm -hmm. in, the, in the commune, you know, and then in the Russian Revolution. But socialism is not Russian, it's not Soviet. No. And the, the Paris commune probably had cooler uh, uniforms. I don't think they were uniforms, but you know. Um, so yeah, it has nothing to, uh, there is a certain strain of kind of Soviet fetishism in, in this country we've talked about before. Um, you know, just, just holding on to the symbols of one particular uh, socialist uh, experiment in the past, I don't think is some, serves our purpose. Uh, for waging the class struggle right now in the United States, and especially taking on the the symbols of another uh, from another society, I, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't even remember how cool those uniforms are. I don't, you know. So, yeah. I think cutting the military budget is a better concept than defunding it, because when I think about the verb defund, it means deplete completely, <laughs> and we're for transferring that money to human need. That's always been our position. You know, and you can start with cutting that nuclear stockpile that'll kill us a hundred times where only roaches will survive, you know? Um, and, and God bless the roaches if they make it, you know? So roaches and a few I billionaires with their own fallout shelters. So another kind of right, road. Right, right, right. And, and, and them jokers who have uh, up on the space station. <laughs> You know, um, which is where I'd like to be. By the way, I'm a uh, I'm a space station Star Trek kind of kind of guy. Well, um, I think that that just about does it. Uh, we got any programs coming up, Michael? Michael's a program upcoming program uh, man. We do, what, and uh, what's in store? I think, it's, I think it's November 17th. Um, we're gonna have a program uh, with a a, a doctor. Uh, Prijak, I think is how you pronounce it, from the Communist Party of India, Marxist. He's going to be talking to us about um, the fights against neoliberalism and neo-fascism in the 21st century. And they have, an ex they have uh, some experience with that over there in India with their kind of Trump-like president, uh, Modi, you know, anti-Islamic, Hindu nationalist uh, kind of dictator. So um, mark your calendars for that and sign up on cpusa.org. It'll be very good. And then there's the Communist Party Central Committee meeting on Sunday, 12 noon. If you get lucky, we might stream it on Facebook. You'll be able to listen to part of the meeting. And uh, we're going to be talking about big politics, <clears throat> big ideas, big struggle. Uh, no more uh, Joe Sims' mix and match Marxism. We're going to have some Marxism, Leninism up in the house on Sunday at 12 noon. So be there or uh, be square. Uh, and until then, stay strong, stay safe, stay in the fight, and have a great week. And Rosanna will be back next week. She was on vacation uh, this week, well-deserved rest. And we look forward to her rejoining us and continuing the uh, debate on Good Morning Revolution. Until then, take care, everybody, and stay strong. And I already said that. Bye. 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 Good morning, Revolution. Good morning, Revolution.